in church. Hey, come on, why don't you stand? Put your hands together. Come on, just like this. Come on, we're going to sing. We're going to worship this morning. Why don't you join us? Hey, sing this. I was buried beneath my shame. Till I met you, oh, come on, and I was breathing but not alive, hey. and all my failures I tried to hide, oh yeah, it was my tool, and Jesus, till I met you, every voice, call us, sing it out, come on. Church, how do you guys feel this morning? Anybody excited to be in God's house today? Come on, this is the day the Lord has made. Scripture says, I'll rejoice and be glad in it. Church, we're stepping into Holy Week. Today is Palm Sunday. This Today begins what the church has set aside to, to celebrate and to honor and remember Jesus' last words, his last, the last things that he did on his life during his life here on earth. And today is Palm Sunday. What we remember today is when Jesus began his, what we call his triumphal entry. He marched into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey's colt, just like the Old Testament prophets prophesied and predicted that he would. And if you know the story, thousands of people lined the streets of Jerusalem, raving palm branches. And do you know what they said? They said, Hosanna. Hosanna, 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And I began to look at that, wor that word. And that word Hosanna, you know what that means? It means save us. Please save us, Lord, deliver us today. And I wonder if we might echo that prayer this morning. So all across the room, you've done this a couple times this morning, but I just wanna ask you just to take a second, close your eyes for a moment, take a deep breath, whatever it is you gotta do. Just take a moment with just you and the Lord, you and the Holy Spirit, away from the distractions, away from to-do lists, just you and the Lord. And I'd ask you just, would you lift your hands with me to heaven as an act of a uh, posture of surrender? Would you just pray this with me? Would you say, Lord, save us? Come on, sing that, Lord, I need a savior. So Lord, will you save me? I wanna encourage you as we stay in that posture, everything that you need, Jesus paid for on the cross and it is yours as a, as a son and as a daughter. When he gave up his spirit on the cross and hanging from that tree that I should have been on and he echoed the words, it is finished. He paid for everything that you need and it's available for you today. Death has, tri love has triumphed over death now and forever. So come on, let's sing that together. We love you, Lord.
name higher, there's no name greater than the name of Jesus. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Come on, would you lift your hands across the room, sing us together, come on. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. Oh, my thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry. Can you sing it out? Your holy, all creation cries. Come on, sing it.
what John said. And I wanna just take a moment and pray together before we continue and think about as we've sang those words, what name threatens like the highest power in your mind and how can you just replace that name with the power of saying Jesus? So let me pray for us and we'll keep going. God, thank you for your sacrifice for us, that your name is bigger. God, today we put the name of the power or position or person or thing that threatens to take the place of who you are in our lives. And we just say your name over it, Jesus. Hosanna, save us. We love you, Lord, it's in your name, amen. Well, good morning, Northwest. How are you guys doing this morning? So good, my name is Anne, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here on staff. And if this is your first time, we especially wanna say welcome to you. We are so glad to have you here. I wanna tell you on your way out today, we'd love to stop you, have you stop by Info Central. And there you'll meet some people who would just love to meet you and answer any questions you have and give you a gift. We can hardly believe it, but Easter is coming up next weekend. Anybody excited for that? Yes? We are too, and as we get ready for that and just know that Easter every year is a time that we get to meet so many people who check out church for the very first time. I wanna to talk to those of you in the room who you would consider Traders Point your home, like you're bought in here. I wanna invite you to be on mission with us in two ways next weekend. The first, I wanna invite you to attend Saturday at four or 6 p.m. or Sunday morning at 7.30, I know that's early, we're gonna have breakfast at seven, it's gonna be a grand old time. But the reason is because we have so many people that come and join us and they usually come at those two middle hours on Sunday morning and we wanna make as much room as possible so that everybody can have a great experience. The second way I wanna invite you to be on mission with us is by serving and there are so many different places for you to make a difference. I'm not asking you to do anything that me and my family are not gonna do. I'll be serving in kids on Sunday, probably parking on Saturday, who's to say, attending on Saturday night. But you can make such a difference by meeting the people and showing them Jesus through so many different ways. So if you are ready to do that, sign up on our website. That should be behind me, or it was, tbcc.org. It's somewhere there. Sign up to serve. We really can't wait to have you there. Before we keep going, our teaching pastor Ryan is gonna come up and give the message. Before we do that, say hello to some people around you and then you can find your seat. Today marks the end of a season and the beginning of a new chapter for the Midtown campus. We get the opportunity to experience the grand opening of our permanent home. So many people have been in preparation to make this day happen, helping to make it look beautiful and welcoming. Today marks a significant milestone in the life of our church as we take another step to releasing the church all throughout our city. We do that through our giving, our loving, and our kindness. And I believe that's what this church is all about. celebrate Midtown getting into their permanent location. <laughs> Traders Point transforming grocery stores into churches since 2022. <laughs> I think after one more we get like an HG TV special. I think that's the way that works, but no. Great start. They had hundreds of people show up opening weekend and they had two baptisms. Can we celebrate that? God is already at work over there. It was a big week for us as a church. We also had our Rooted Celebration on Tuesday night where 58 people got baptized right here in this room. And I don't want us to just look past that and be like, oh, wow, that's cool, that happened. Like, that is what we prayed for. 
A lot of you were around when we started the Awaken initiative and we were praying, asking God to awaken us, to talk about what does it look like for God to release the church, revive the city and restore hope to the world and he is doing it. And if you wanna get involved, maybe you missed that section, you just started coming, you can always go to vision.tpcc.org to figure out what it looks like for you to get involved. But excited for today because we're continuing in our series, Red Letter Talks. And what are red letters? Well, red letters uh, are in your Bibles. They're just on a few of the pages, right? They're in the Gospels, the biography of Jesus' life, and then they're towards the end. And you'll notice, like, most of your Bible is black ink. And then you switch over, and then there's these red letters. And the red letters tell us that these are the words of Jesus. These are the, is the evidence that Jesus came. These were taken down by I. Witnesses, people that sat with Jesus, heard him speak, and then are now sharing these words. And what we've been doing in this series is looking at the, some of the last red letters that Jesus would ever speak right before he would go to the cross. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and flip or open to John chapter 17, verse 20. This is where we're going to be starting today. These are the words of Jesus here. He says, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. And I just wanna stop and pause about how wild this is and how important it is for us and to look at these red letters and not to just skim past them because these red letters tell us what God is like. If Jesus is God, then what this verse just says is that God prayed for you. Like, don't just blow by that. Like, that tells us so much. There's implications to if that is true. Because maybe you've been living your life and you pray sometimes, but it's, it feels weird. And you always wonder, like, is God really even on the other side of this? Does God hear my prayers? Does God want to hear my prayers? This tells us that he does. Like, let me explain. We all have three different kinds of friends, right? We, we have friends that we know that if we call them, they are not going to answer, right? <laughs> They're also the same people that somehow don't have a voice mailbox that has been set up yet. I didn't even know that was an option. But they'll text you back in a few days and be like, you good, everything okay? No, that's why I called you, because I was not okay, but thank you for, for nothing. We have friends that aren't gonna answer when we call but then we have people that will. Like, there are people in your life, in your phone, that you know no matter what's going on, you call them, they are gonna answer the phone. That is a good friend. But then there's another group of friends. And there's that friend that doesn't just accept your call when it comes in, but they call you. That they don't just want something from you, they want something for you. They just wanna check on you. They just wanna have a relationship with you. If these words are from Jesus. And if these words are from God, that means we have a God who prays for us. So it answers the question of does he hear our prayers? Of course. Does he want to hear our prayers? Of course. If he was willing to pray for us, that settles it. And then maybe for you, the next logical question is, okay, God prays for us. What does God pray for? Like, I know what my prayers look like. I know what I throw up to him. But what would God pray for? That's right here in John chapter 17, verse 21. He says, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. This is Jesus' prayer for the church, for me and you that we would be one. As close as he is with God, he wants that for us, for us to have that with him and for one another. And maybe when you hear that, that prayer seems really big. It almost seems impossible because when you look out into the world, all you see is disunity and separation. And I'm not even just talking about the world, I'm talking about like the big C church around the world. The headlines make it seem like the church is separating and splintering and shrinking, maybe, maybe, but what if, what if the church isn't splintering, but what if God is pruning right now? What if God is prepped and ready, removing the branches that are no longer bearing fruit? What if an act of God is about 
to happen and we could be a part of it. Doesn't that change things? What what if he is looking to do something? And from what I see when I read the Bible is when things seem impossible, that's usually when God shows up. And if God prayed for it, then it can come to pass, even as big as it sounds, that all the churches and all the world would be united as one. The question isn't, can it happen? It's are me and you prepared to play our part in it? Think about this. So much of our lives spent praying to God, asking him to play his part in fulfilling our prayers. Are you prepared to play a part in his? It got quiet. You see how the turntables have turned. That's what me and you get to be a part of. He has shared what he wants for me and you to have this kind of unity. And me and you get to play a part in fulfilling the prayers of Jesus. Like, what an honor. How, though? How is that going to happen? In a world that is so different with so many of us coming from different backgrounds, we have so many reasons to be separated. What is it that could actually bring us all together? That's what he's going to share here in John chapter 17. Look at this. He says, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. It's all wrapped up here. Everything that we need to be united together is right here. And I want to start with this one word that maybe you read it, but I want us to circle it if, you, if you're taking notes. And it's the word sent. Did you notice that? It says that Jesus was sent. We don't talk like that, right? There, there's a difference. When we talk about we were being born and not just being, not sent. Like if you were having a conversation with someone and you're like, hey, man, what's your birthday? And they were like, well, I was sent to earth on February 16th. You'd be like, I'm sorry, I don't even want to do this. Um, it's okay. <laughs> What are you talking about? You're sent. But what Jesus is saying here is that he was sent, meaning he existed before he became a man. He existed before the foundations of the earth. He always was. What Jesus is doing here is making the claim that he is God. So the first thing is that Jesus isn't just another teacher telling us, hey, this is the way to unity. This is how you can all be one. He is the way. He is the Savior that came to bring us and unite us, first with God and with one another. Then what's the X factor? What is this Savior going to bring? What is it going to be that is strong enough to bring us all together? It's right there in his prayer. He says, I I want them to know that you love them as much as you love me. I want you to hear this. We have a God who loves us just as much as he loves Jesus. Do you believe that? I don't know. I want to believe that. But I think if we believe that, really, if you believe that, you would be happier. You would be more joyful. You would be less fearful. You would have more courage, if you really believed that God loved you exactly like he loved Jesus, that, that, would, that would change things. Like, what if the fact that God loves you like he loves Jesus was the truest thing about you? Of all the things that are true about you and all the ways you've come to know yourself and others have known you, how they've known you, what if the truest thing about you was the fact that God loved you, that you were loved? Because I would argue that disunity comes whenever we're known in whatever title we accept other than you are loved by God. That's when disunity comes. Think about that. The reason we don't have unity with other people is because we don't feel worthy of love or we make a decision to say, I don't think you are worthy of love. But think about how different it would be for me and you if the truest thing about us, what we believe most about ourselves was the fact that we are loved by God. 
that's even hard to say. It's hard to sit with that kind. And it's not even love from God. Have you ever had to like sit with someone and then to have them share with you that they love you? It's hard to receive it. You almost wanna look away or make a joke. It is hard to believe that we are worthy of love, but you are. And it will be the thing, when we realize that we are worthy of love, it'll be the thing that unites us. But so often we settle for such lower titles. We become known by such smaller things. When we begin to ask the question of who am I, we say things like, well, I'm, I, I'm, an, I'm an addict. I'm the one who was abandoned by the people that were supposed to love me. I'm the one with the mental health issues. I'm the one with the past. Do you hear me? Some of those things, maybe even all of those things may be somewhat true about you, but it is not the truest thing about you. The truest thing about you is that you are loved by God. Who am I? I'm the one that is loved by God. Who am I? I'm the one that was made in the image of God. Who am I? I'm the one that God left heaven for that came here to live and die for me. Who am I? I am worthy of love. That is who you are. When we begin to believe that, we will naturally become united with one another. And when we begin to see that in other people, because what happens when we place anything else here, when something else becomes the most true thing other than God loves you and God loves them, we create reason for division. I give myself a reason to hate you. Big extreme examples of this are like racism and sexism. I look at you and I say you are unworthy of love because what I've done is say that the most, the truest thing about you isn't the fact that you are loved by God, it's that you are this or that. And how can we be united to people that we don't even love? There are people in our church that struggle with these things. Racism, sexism, other false beliefs about groups of people. And I'm telling you, God wants to get that out of us. And when we begin to see that they are not those things, they are children of God. They have been made in his image they bear his image and they are worthy of his love. Who am I to say that someone isn't worthy of love when God already says they are? We have this love that overwhelms us and joins us together. And then we also have a shared experience. You know how shared experiences really like join you together with people. It makes you close when you have this shared experience. When you talk to like, people that were in the, the military and, and they were together on the front lines, there was a closeness that was created there. They had this shared experience. Or maybe you were on a team and you practiced and you played, you went to the championship, you won, all these things. You had these shared experiences. Or maybe for me, it's like when you worked at Burger King, right? You were surrounded by these people over and over and you went through life together. I talk about Burger King like prison. Like I... I still see people out that I see that I used to work with. I'm like, hey, how's it going? Yeah, Burger King, right? Yeah, yeah. 38th Street, I, I did a little time there, but um, <laughs> most of my time was at 10th Street. There's this experience that we have. And there's a experience that all Christians share in that unite us, that bring us closer. And that's the reason that when you place your faith in Jesus, you have a closeness and a unity with any other group of people, whether that's for any other affinity or even ethnicity, there's this closeness that you have because you have this shared experience. And I wanna show you what that shared experience is. It's in Romans chapter six. He says, or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been, say it with me, united with him in his death, we will also be raised to new life as he was. And maybe it's been hard for you to understand why we celebrate baptisms. These people standing in, in, in the water, dunking each other and coming back up. It's because it's a symbol of what's really happening 
underneath the surface. What's happening is as they're standing, standing in that water, that's not just water, it represents a watery grave. And as they are lowered underneath the water, they are sharing in a death. The death that Jesus died on the cross, they are sharing in this death that for 2,000 years other Christians have shared in as well. And then they are raised to new life, united with God and with others. That's why we are celebrating this new life. And now this new life is so different because we're no longer just individuals. We've been brought in, grafted in into the family of God. The word we have for that is the church. The church isn't talked about in scripture as this place that you go. It's a group of people. It's a body where Jesus is the head and me and you are the body. And we all play different parts where I'm a finger, you're a toe, you're a hand, you're a leg. And then for the rest of our time here on earth, we figure out what does it look like for us to live as one, for your strengths and my strengths to come together and to do this together. And we step on each other's toes, but we live it out because it is God's will for our life until one day when we pass away and then we are moved and ushered into all of eternity. I don't even understand exactly what this looks like, but the oneness, the unity is perfected. We are in the presence and in the glory of God and we are there with him and we feel the full weight of what it means to be united. That is what God wants for us. Why does he want this? What is he, what's his reasoning? What's his rationale for having us united? It says it right here in John chapter 17, and I love the message translation of why Jesus wants us to be united. He says, then they will be mature in this oneness and give the godless world evidence that you've sent me and love them in the same way you've loved me. He's saying, I want you to be one. I want you to be together. I want you to be united because you are going to be the evidence of my love. Because Jesus knew he was going to leave us with some pretty wild claims. That we are going to have to tell people about what we believe. And just, just hear it out loud. It sounds like a lot. What do you believe? What, what is Christianity? Well, I believe, um, uh, I believe God became man. Yeah? It's like, okay, I'm with you. And then he lived this perfect life. Okay. And then he went to a cross and he died and all these people saw him dead. And then they took him down and they threw him into a tomb. Like, okay. And then he resurrected. He came back. He came back to life. He came back to life. Yeah, um, we believe that. And then, and then he lived, and a bunch of people saw him. And then he ascended into heaven. Okay, I'm gonna need some proof. I'm gonna need some evidence. And God says the evidence for them to help them understand and believe that that really happened is your unity. Think about it like this. We have this with our friends, like when they say something or you hear something, they make some outlandish claim, you're like, uh, I'm gonna need some evidence. You gotta prove to me that that really happened. Like if I told you I had four kids, you, may, you might be like, you look way too young to have four kids, bro. Like, show me some evidence. And then I would show you my minivan. And it's pretty clear, right? Like why would a normal person without four kids be driving around in a minivan? You'd be like, point taken, enough seen here. I believe you. A united church is the evidence of God's love. In a world where we are called to share the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is and all that he's done, as wild of a claim as that is, that this man died, resurrected, defeated sin and death all together, that there's a way that me and you can live that will complement that. That when people hear that, they'll be like, that is so hard to understand, that is so hard to believe. But then you look over and you see this pocket of people, this church, that loves one another and is united and lives one together. And he's like, I don't understand how to explain that though. In a world that is so fearful and anxious, there's a group of people over there that seem so courageous and poised and have peace. I don't understand it. And then they begin to see the only way that makes sense is that if this man really did die and resurrect, it only makes sense. The way that they lived, the way that they are united, it only makes sense if Jesus is who he said he is. That's what God wants us to be, the evidence of his love. What does a united church look like? Well, a united church shares their problems, their possessions, and their prayers. If you're taking notes, hopefully you've been taking notes, you know, the whole time. But if not, right now is a good time to start too. What I want us to do is just look at each one of these 
And to say, if this is what God's calling us to be, a united church, what are the things that we can do to play a part in fulfilling this prayer of Jesus? The first one there is problems. That me and you, that to bring us into the kind of unity that Jesus is talking about here, we have to be willing to share our problems. And do you see how the gospel helps us do that? Think about all the relationships that you have and the worry that you have of being able to share the real you and the vulnerable side and the problems that you have. That's why most of us have the most boring conversation 10 times a day. Hey, how are you doing? Good, you? Good, good. All right, see you later. Why don't we share? Because we're afraid that if I shared with you my problems, you would withdraw your love that you wouldn't want me around, that you wouldn't think I'm worth it, and I'm not ready to put myself out there. But if I'm not counting on who I am in, in the sense of what I do, but who I am, the truest thing about me is that I'm loved by God and Jesus has already dealt with everything that I've done, I don't have to hide anything he's already dealt with. I can share with you. I can be open with you. I can share my problems with you. And this is what's also commanded in Scripture. Look at this in Galatians with how we live. He says, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, share each other's problems, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think, I love this part, if you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. <laughs> that me and you, one of the things that is going to unite us is when we are open enough to share and that you on the other side are willing to carry that burden, willing to share in that problem with them. Do you have people to share your problems with? Do you have people that when something comes up that you can reach out to, that you can make a call, that you can knock on somebody's door and say, hey, this is what I'm going through. Can you help me? I can tell you the data doesn't look great for adults who have real friendships, people that they can count on and they can trust with their problems. And for all the youth in the room, I'm talking like middle school and high school students, I just want to say that now is the time to start dealing with your problems in a healthy way. Because right now you're starting to have new problems. And those old problems that you thought would be going away by now are becoming bigger problems. And you're wondering, what do I do with these problems? That's why I love our youth ministry here. It's groups based. It's, sur it's surrounding yourself with a leader and other people in a safe place to be able to share your problems. Do you have that? Do you have people that you can share your possessions with? And don't get weird, like Christians still believe in private property and all that stuff, but we also believe that everything we have is a gift. Every good thing first went through the hands of God, and it's not ours, we're stewards of it. And we have been blessed to be a blessing. Do you have people to share your possessions with? This is one of the early marks of the church, which caused the whole watching world to be like very curious. They had never seen people like this who shared things, who gave other people things that they didn't have to. And they were all different people. It wasn't like their family, people that looked different than them, spoke different languages than them. Like, why are you being so kind? Why are you sharing this way? Well, it's because of Jesus. But look at this in Acts chapter 4. It says, all the believers were united in heart and mind. They'd been united in Jesus. And they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. Do you have people to share your possessions with? You know, a part of being a church, that's why we give offerings and tithes. It's because I know that what I have, I want to give to others. Not just even here in the city, but around the world. I want to play my part in helping them get what they do not currently have. But then there's also the side of personally. Like, what does it look like for me to share possessions with my friends and my family and to be a good neighbor? Like, I have lived in a lot of different places. Uh, since we got married, we've moved around a few different neighborhoods. Most of them have been pretty similar. Like, your similar makeup of nobody really talks. You kind of pull up to the house, go into the garage. You see people maybe on the weekends with a wave. That's about it. But this one place we lived, it was a different kind of community. Um, it was filled with a lot of... Uh, 
uh, older people, all right, a different generation than the one I came up in. And one day we were hanging out at the house and we're just playing. And then I hear the doorbell ring. And to me, the doorbell is an alarm that tells me someone is here that shouldn't be. So I immediately, instincts like cut in, I drop down. I'm like making eye contact with my wife. I'm like, step down. And I'm like looking, who is ringing a doorbell on a Saturday? And it's my neighbor. And she's holding like this giant pan. And I open the door, I'm like, hey, everything okay? She's like, yeah. And I'm like, she's like, I have these baked beans. And I'm like, you're bringing me a pan of baked beans? <laughs> and she's like, our oven just went down and I was wondering if I could use your oven to heat these up. I was like, I didn't even know you could do that. Like, you, <laughs> yeah, sure, come, <laughs> come on in. But I was convicted by that of the way she lived and the way she saw our relationship and how open she was to just coming over and sharing and wanting me to share. Like for me, if my oven went down, we're going to Chick-fil-A. Like the God has intervened, he will provide. <laughs> but there was something sweet about this idea of like, man, what would it look like to have this relational web where we could share things, that we could count on one another we could depend on one another. You think about how much unity that brings when we begin to share our possessions with one another. And then our prayers. Do you have people that you can share your prayers with? I want you to look at this in 1 Timothy. This is what's commanded. He urges us. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them to intercede on their behalf. This is what Jesus was doing for us in John chapter 17. He is the great high priest. He is taking us to God. He is praying for us, praying on our behalf. Do you have people to share your prayers with? Do you have people that, because I can't think of a, a thing that would unite you more than anything else to know that you have someone in your life that is taking your name before the God of all things that you know that they could be doing anything with the prayer time, that they know that this is this exclusive space where heaven and earth overlap, where they have an audience with God and they're using that time to talk about you. Do you have people that you can share your prayers with? Because that's a big thing. Like when we think about that, because there's so many of us that maybe you started coming to church and you're kind of on the fringe now and you come when you can. You're like, I really don't get it. I don't feel like that closeness. I don't feel like the purpose of it all. I have friends that I'm closer with at like the YMCA or at work than I am at church. I, I would challenge you with the fact that maybe you're doing it wrong. And maybe you're not sharing your problems with one another. And just because you stand in proximity with someone, you sing next to them, and you can almost hear their voice, that's not gonna bring you into the type of unity that Jesus is talking about here. It's when we get to this space and we realize who he is and we're willing to share all of these things, then we get to experience the life that he has for us. And maybe you're here today and you're like, ah, I want that. When you're hearing about this God that loves you unconditionally, that the truest thing about you could be the fact that you are loved, you're like, I want that. I want to be surrounded by people like that that will love me imperfectly but will show up for me. I want that type of community. How do I get it? I just say that Christianity is so different than everything else. Because even the way we think about it, it's like, what do I have to do? What do I have to just tell me? And we spend so much of our lives trying to do better, trying to do more, thinking that once we do more, then we'll be able to experience these and to fulfill this ache and desire that we have in us. But the Bible talks about it very differently. Did you see the word Jesus used over and over again in John chapter 17? He said, I want them to be able to see. I want them to be able to see who I am. I want them to be able to see my glory because once they see me for who I am, that'll be the motivation. That'll be the thing that brings them to unity. That'll be the thing that brings them to faith. It's when we see it. When we see what Jesus did with our problems, 
that he made our problems his problems, that that's why he came to earth, that's why he lived the perfect life, that's why he went to a cross and died for me and you to help, to help carry our burdens, to deal with our problems. When you begin to wonder, like, how could I live a life where I'm so open-handed with my possessions that I could share what I have and what I worked for with other people that don't even deserve it? It only comes when you see that God gave his most prized possession to you and me, his one and only son. And you see that if God can do that, then I can do this. And then when you see that the God of this universe prayed for you, that he wanted unity with you, and what he ultimately wants is you for eternity with him forever. When you begin to see that, when you see that Jesus went toe to toe with the devil, when he fought hell and won, and he handed you the victory, when you see that, That'll be the thing that clicks. That'll be the thing that brings you to the spot to want more of it. Not trying, but just seeing. And you can, if you've seen that today, you can respond to that today. We would love to be here with you. We're gonna have people at all of our campuses that would love to pray with you and talk about what does it look like to live as if the truest thing about you is that you are loved by God. And for others, Maybe you're in this spot and you're like, I've been coming for a little bit. I grew up in the church, but if I'm being honest, I've never, I've never been of a part of a church like that where you actually live life with people, where you share your problems and you share your possessions and you share real prayers, not just like twice removed prayers of like, can you pray for my aunt's cat? Um, no. Um, but if you want that, if you want to know what it looks like to really be a part of a united church, rooted. Rooted registration is open right now. And here's what it is. It is a 10-week experience where you get connected with a small group of people and you learn and you get to experience what does it look like to share my problems, my possessions, and prayers and to play my part in fulfilling Jesus' prayer for all of us. That's open to you. And then for all the rest of us, what I want to speak to is we are approaching one of the biggest days of the year for the church. It's going to be Easter weekend next weekend. And I want you to think about this because here's what I know. I've been around here. This will be my 14th Easter at Traders Point. Every single Easter I've seen Pastor Aaron stand up here and deliver the gospel. He has shared who Jesus is, that he loves us, that he died for us, and now there is resurrected hope for you and me. I believe he is going to present that gospel this weekend. What if me and you could be the evidence of God's love? What if the first thing that they could see after they hear who God says they are is how we treat them, how we love them, that this would make sense even more so because of the way these people are treating me. And here's what we can do to get ready and prepared for this upcoming weekend is Good Friday. Good Friday, our team has put together an incredible online only experience. It is filled with worship and teaching and communion and a chance for us to center our hearts, to be prepared to go into this weekend, to believe that God is at work, that God is uniting his people. And then the other thing that I would say is sign up to serve. Registration is open right now, tpcc.org slash Easter, because I want to paint a picture for you. We know that people come Easter weekend that never come, that maybe come once or twice a year. There's going to be people that never accept an invitation to come to church, but they're going to come next weekend. What if when they come and they show up on to one of our campuses and they pull up in the parking lot and they can't even really make sense of what's happening, but there's an army, a fleet of people out there directing traffic and smiling. And you know it's gonna be almost April, but it's Indiana, so it's gonna be snowing or raining. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty cool. There's people out here. And then they walk in. And they walk into this lobby and the music's going, it feels warm. And there's people that are excited to see them and are glad that they came. You're like, no one's ever glad that I come into a place. This is kind of nice. And then there's coffee and not just coffee, there's free coffee. Who does free coffee? We do. And then they take their kids into kids ministry and they drop them off. And there's this group of people there to meet them that seem to love their kids just as much as they do. And they're like, this is, this is crazy. And they walk into one of our auditoriums and then they, they experience the worship, and it's beautiful. And then Pastor Aaron gets up and preaches the gospel, and they hear about this God that loves them and wants a relationship with them, that lived a perfect life, defeated sin and the grave, and is extending an invitation to them that they could have this new life. 
And then they begin to see this whole experience differently. And they walk out and they, it begins to make sense. What if the first thing that they could see was an army of hundreds of people ready and waiting to serve them? What if we could be the evidence of God's love this Easter weekend? We can play a part in that. Sign up to serve today. And what I want us to do as we close is to pray. I want us to pray for unity. I want us to have faith and to believe that what Jesus is talking about here is possible. And it's gonna be hard. It's gonna demand some things from us. It's gonna cost us some things, but it will be worth it. So right where you are, just close your eyes, bow your head and join me in this prayer, the prayer of unity. Father, thank you so much for today. God, thank you for these red letters. God, thank you for sending a savior. God, thank you for making it painfully clear that we are loved. God, help us to not look away. Help us to not be intimidated by that. Help us not to reject that, but to believe it. We are loved and not with just any kind of love. We are loved with the same love that you love Jesus. God, allow that love to define us. Allow that love to decide what we do and don't do. Allow that love to give us the courage to press on. Allow that love to put us out there and to be vulnerable and to be united. Allow that love to help us to be open-handed with what you have for us. Allow that love to be what brings our problems out. We don't hide behind them. We trust you. God, allow that love to bring us to the spot of being open-handed with every possession we have. God, allow that love to bring us to the place of prayer. Let us be dependent on you. Let us trust you. Father, we believe that you called for it. We believe that you called for unity so it is possible, but we know it's only possible through your spirit and through your power. So we ask right now, show up. Lead us, guide us, show us what we need to do so that we can play a part in fulfilling your prayer. May we be one, Jesus. Father, it is in your perfect and holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, Cross from Hey, I want to invite you guys to stand for a moment. And if you're here and you're part of our prayer team, why don't you go ahead and make your way down to the sides of the room today? Church, as we move on in today's service, we're gonna give you guys the opportunity to do all the things that Ryan was just talking about. Be the church. And so if you're here today and you're walking through something, you just need wisdom, you need wisdom, you need guidance. You just need someone to meet with you and pray with you and, and, and someone to just share your problems with. Or you're here today and you're ready to make the most important, exciting decision of your life decision to go all in, give your heart fully to Jesus today. We have our prayer teams that are gonna be lined up across both sides of the room. They're gonna have a lanyard. You'll see them right here. I wanna invite you as we sing this next song, just slip out of your seat, make your way on down to the aisles and pray with some of our prayer team members that are gonna be here as we sing. Come on. Cause your name is the highest, your name is the greatest in your name and stands above them all and all thrones and dominions all powers and positions in your name stands above them all oh, sing it again come on your name is the highest your
team will be on the sides, will be coming down here at the front. We would love to pray with you. And as we look forward to Easter next weekend, please be thinking of the person in your life that you wanna invite to join you. If you need some help with that, we've got some invite cards out at Info Central. We would love to give those away. Please take them and share them with people in your life to invite them to join you at Easter. Have an amazing Sunday and we'll see you next weekend.